Amen. Well, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you didn't get notes, just raise your hand, and we will make sure that you get some notes. You should have got them in your bulletin. But we are continuing our series called Be Faithful, and it's a study through the book of 1 Timothy. Today we will be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. How many of you have ever felt a little scared in terms of sharing the gospel, evangelism? If if that's been you, raise your hand real high. It can be a little scary, right? But we are called to do that. But before we're called to share the message of the gospel as believers in Jesus Christ, we're called to some other things prior. Because if we don't do these prior things, sharing the message won't even be on our minds. And so today I just want us to see how the faithful believer prays for the lost. How the faithful believer prays for the lost. And we're going to see that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-8. through 8. Remember, Paul is speaking to Timothy. He calls him a beloved son in the faith. He is pastoring at the church of Ephesus. And Paul has encouraged Timothy to stay there because there was a lot of false teaching, a lot of false doctrine being preached And some of the leaders in that church were taking the church astray. And so Paul encourages Timothy to stay on there and correct those who need correcting and make sure that the clear gospel is being taught at Ephesus. It's within this context that we see Paul begin to urge these people and Paul begin to urge Timothy to pray. But it takes a kind of an odd turn in terms of who he tells him To pray for, and we're going to see that this morning. The first thing that I want us to understand is the nature of evangelistic prayer. The nature of evangelistic prayer. What is the nature of evangelistic prayer? If you look in verse 1, let's look at it together. Paul says this, first of all, he's saying this is one of the most important things that you can understand, Timothy. First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. That's the first thing that Paul says is one of the most important things. And this gets into the nature of the type of prayers that you and I should be praying as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. They are to be evangelistic prayers. Maybe you've slacked a little bit in your prayer life. Or even if you are praying, maybe it's a list like a lot of us get in the habit of doing. We make lists in our prayer life, right? This is what I need. This is what I want. This is what's going on in my life, Lord. And Paul would say, you know, one of the most important things when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in essence what we're doing is praying for the salvation of other people. That the Lord's kingdom would be built And the Lord's kingdom is built when people come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ and are entered into the kingdom of God. The nature of evangelistic prayer. What is the nature of evangelistic prayer? Well, number one, we are to pray from a sense of need. Everybody say need. Oh, we can do better than that this morning. Everybody say need. Need. We are to pray from a sense of need. As believers in Jesus Christ, not for our need, but the needs of those who are lost. In treaties here, when he uses the word in treaties, it means to be without something. Paul is saying that these people are without salvation. And we should be praying on their behalf for their need of salvation. It's the need of every lost soul. Have you prayed for that lately? Have you prayed for the salvation of those who are lost around you? John MacArthur has a great quote. He says, as we look out on the masses of lost humanity, the enormity of the need should drive us to our knees in evangelistic prayer. I want to read to you something a little bit more uh, hard to kind of understand. It's just not in the common vernacular, but it's from uh, a gentleman by the name of Richard Baxter from the 17th century. He was a Puritan, but it, it was something that just struck my heart, and I want to share with you this morning. This is what Richard Baxter said. He said, oh, if you have the hearts of Christians or of men in you, let them yearn towards your poor, ignorant, ungodly neighbors. Sounds a little harsh at first, right? But listen to what he says. Alas, there is but a step betwixt them and death and hell. Many hundred diseases are waiting, ready to seize on them. 
And if they die unregenerate, they are lost forever. Have you hearts of rock that cannot pity men in such a case as this? If you believe not the word of God and the danger of sinners, why are you Christians yourselves? If you do believe it, why do you not bestir yourselves to the helping of others? Do you not care who is damned, so you be saved? If so, you have sufficient cause to pity yourselves, for it is a frame of spirit utterly inconsistent with grace. Dost thou live close by them, or meet them in the streets, or labor with them, or travel with them, or sit and talk with them, and say nothing to them of their souls, or the life to come? If their houses were on fire, thou wouldst run and help them, and wilt thou not help them when their souls are almost at the fire of hell? We should have a desire and a passion in prayer for the needs of the lost around us. We are to pray from a sense of need. Are we too wrapped up in our own lives to care about the lost? You see, I think one of the devil's greatest, greatest weapons against the believer is the weapon of, are you ready for this? Say amen. Distraction. Distraction with our own pleasure, with our own comfort, with our own entertainment. Entertainment has become a huge God in our culture. And we are so wrapped up and consumed with ourselves and entertaining ourselves and making sure that we are comfort in comfort and pleasure ourselves. We forget and we close our eyes and we have a blind eye to the lost around us. But the faithful believer, the faithful believer, believer understands that their prayers must be filled with a pleading and a begging to God to bring the lost to salvation. We are to pray from a sense of need. Secondly, we are to pray from a sense of worship. You see, prayers here, he says, entreaties and prayers. Prayers is the most generalist. That's the term you and I use when we talk about prayer. It's the most generalist form of prayer, and it's focused directly on God. You see, when you and I pray for the lost, are you with me? Say amen. When you and I get on our knees and seek God and pray to God and passionately call out to God on behalf of the law of the lost around us, what happens is an act of worship. You don't think about that, right? We think worship, we think music, we think singing, and that is a form of worship. But listen, one of the greatest forms of worship that you can do is to pray for the lost. And then when you see the lost person come to Christ in salvation, that also is worship to God. It's double worship. You're praying, you're praying, you're praying for that person you know does not know Christ. And then you see Christ miraculously by the Spirit of God call that person to salvation. And maybe, maybe God uses you to speak to that person about Christ. And they come to faith in Christ. God is praised by that. God is honored by that. Glory goes to his name when you see someone come to Christ in salvation. Amen? Amen. Hopefully you rejoice. If you hear, I've noticed a little bit of a dip in churches when we hear, oh, so-and-so got saved. Oh, that's good. Praise God. Man, there should be more desire, more praise, and more passion in our voices when someone comes into the kingdom of God. And you know why there's not? It's because we haven't prayed for that person. So we have no invested interest. We haven't sought God with our tears and with our hearts and with our passions and with our muscles and with everything within us to say, God, please save this person. Because if we were, when that person came to Christ, we would shout, praise God. Glory be to God. I've been praying for a long time for that person. Faithful believer prays for the lost. We our pray. We pray from a sense of need for the lost. We pray from a sense of worship. We pray from a sense of involvement. This is the word petitions. It's a sense of involvement. Petitions means to fall in with someone. Does that make sense? When we think of falling in with someone, we think of falling in with the wrong crowd, right? Oh, they just fell in with the wrong crowd. That's why they're on drugs. That's why they, they, they drink too much. They fell in with the wrong crowd. But you can fall in for people and not fall into that stuff. You can fall in on behalf of people and petition God to save them. It means we care. That's what it means, ultimately. We care. We care about the lost. 
Petitions is a word of advocacy with more feeling and concern. It involves empathy, sympathy, compassion, and involvement. And I think the number one reason that people don't share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, the number one reason that Christians don't share the gospel, you know what they'll say? They'll say it's because they're scared, but really it's because they don't have enough empathy. It's because we don't care enough. Because when we care enough, we get over our fear. Amen? Let me prove it to you. If your spouse or your child is in a burning building and you know they're in there, your fear will dissipate because of your care and concern for that person. And you will rush into that building and rescue that person because your care and concern and love for that person exceeds your fear. Amen? Amen. This is the attitude we are to have as believers. That we are so concerned with those around us who are lost and dying and on their way to hell and separation from God for all of eternity. That we would get past our fear and care enough to do something. Enough to be involved with them. Evangelistic prayer is not cold or detached or impersonal. It's not like a public defender assigned to represent a defendant. Understanding the depths of their misery and pain and their coming doom, we cry out to God for the salvation of sinners. Amen, church? Fourthly, we are to pray from a sense of gratitude. The word here used is thanksgiving. It's not just for our own salvation. We don't pray for the lost around us because we're thankful of our own salvation, even though that's true. It's for the opportunity to share the gospel with someone else. It's a gratefulness to God that he has extended the the offer of salvation to others around us, and also it's understanding that it is a privilege. Everybody say privilege. It's a privilege to speak the gospel to others, to share the good news that Christ has died for them. And if they will put their faith and trust in him, they too, just like I am a sinner, can escape the punishment for our sin. Charles Spurgeon warned of an attitude of apathy. See, what I feel happening right now in this church is some amens and some there's some, there's some feelings starting to move. And there's some, you're right, Pastor Dave, and you, the word of God is already starting to speak. But, but it's going to take a lot to get us out of our apathy. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon says. He warns. He says, one more thing. He's speaking to his own congregation, and I couldn't have said it better to myself. Just take it as if I'm saying it to you. Charles Spurgeon, one more thing, the soul winner, the person who would share the gospel with the lost, must be a master of the art of prayer. You cannot bring souls to God if you do not go to God yourself. You must get your battle axe and your weapons of war from the armory of sacred communication with Christ. If you are much alone with Jesus, you will catch his spirit. You will be fired with the flame that burned in his breast and consumed in his life. You will weep with the tears that fell upon Jerusalem when he saw it perishing. And if you cannot speak so eloquently as he did, yet shall there be about what you say somewhat of the same power in him which thrilled hearts and awoke the consciousnesses of men. My dear hearers, especially you members of the church, I am always so anxious lest any of you should begin to lie upon your oars and take things easy in the matters of God's kingdom. I believe we have come to a place, a place of such comfort and a place that the enemy has lied to us and said that the greatest thing that we can have in this life is fun. That we can seek pleasure and comfort and fun and entertainment above so many other things. And it covers this need of the loss and the things of God and the kingdom of God. You say, Dave, why are you so serious? Because it is a serious matter. And the enemy has tricked us into believing it's no big deal. And we can just live normal lives and we don't have to put an importance on evangelism. And we don't have to do it. It can be done by the missionaries and the pastors. Listen to what he continues to say. He says, there are some of you, I bless you, and I bless God at the remembrance of you, who are in season and out of season, in earnest for winning souls, and you are truly wise. He gives credit where credit is due to those in his church who are winning souls. But then he says this, but I fear there are others whose hands are slack, who are satisfied to let me preach, but do not preach themselves. 
who take these seats and occupies these pews and hope the cause goes well, but that is all they do. Is that you? It's up to Pastor Dave to evangelize. I just got to get them to church. No, the call, the call of evangelism, the call of discipleship is to every single believer in this room. It's your job to evangelize. Your job to share the gospel message. Amen, church? And it's time we get up off our hands and take that job seriously and get over our fears because we care enough about those who are perishing. Praying from a sense of the need of the lost, praying from a sense of worship, knowing that it brings honor and praise to God, praying from a sense of involvement and caring about those who are perishing, and praying from a sense of gratitude. Listen, all these things, they do one thing. They eliminate indifference. We cannot be indifferent to the lost. The faithful believer understands the nature of evangelistic prayer. It's not optional in nature. We must, we must, we must, with great desperation, reach up in prayer for those who are perishing. Evangelism, if it's going to happen in this church, if it's going to catch fire in this church, if it's going to come from more than just the pastors in the church, listen to me, church. Are you listening? To say amen. It's got to come from where you bow and kneel and pray and beg in desperation for God to do something miraculous in our country and even more specifically in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our homes. We must cry out to God from a state of humility in prayer. God, please reach my neighbor. Please reach my friend. Reach my coworker. There needs to be a desperation in our souls. It has to start on our knees. I can't, I, I'm never, if somebody tries to beat you over the head to go soul winning, to witness for Christ, to share the gospel. Listen, even if you do it for a week, a month, a year, it's going to fade out. The power of evangelism comes when we are on our knees calling out to God to save those. And I think it starts with having a, a passion and a desire and a love and a care and a concern for those who are perishing. That's the nature of evangelistic prayer. That's just the start, church. But that's how we ought to think when we think about evangelistic prayer. It's understanding there's a need, the worship that's involved there, the involvement and the care that we have, and being grateful that God has given us that message to share. Paul was so grateful. Have you ever noticed that in his letters? He was so thankful that God had entrusted him with the gospel. And we just take it or leave it. Can you imagine if you had the cure for a disease? A disease like cancer. How joyful and grateful you have, what would be to, to find that cure and then begin to give it to others. Telling them the cure. We have the cure for separation from God for all of eternity. We have the cure for sin. And his name is Christ. And he died on the cross. And if somebody trusts in him, they can have salvation. We have that. Oh, how we ought to be grateful that God has entrusted us with that message. But it's not just that. It's the scope of evangelistic prayer. It's the scope of evangelistic prayer. I want you to see in verses 1 through 6, if you're with me, say amen. amen. Check this out. This is pretty cool. Paul, if you're reading scripture, you need to look out for words that are repeated. Okay, That's good, good biblical study. And this is what Paul says. First of all, then, here's what I want you to see. I'm going to call out the word. It's the word all. All right. First of all, then, I urge, and I'm not talking about that first word, all. I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of what? Say it, church. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> One more time. All men for kings and, say it, church, who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires what, church? men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one meteor for between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for what church? The testimony given at the proper time. You see, Paul is emphasizing the word all. It's not a secret. <laughs> He's trying to convey a point. Who are the all that Paul is referring to? Well, all is all. Amen? He's saying every single person that has ever lived, that's who God wants to save. Just so there's no ambiguity and so there's no confusion, 
Every single person God desires to come to him in salvation. Now, what Christian is there that does not pray for the salvation of their lost friends and family? And these are good things. But what if Paul, when he said the word all, I'm getting like Dr. Seuss here. I'm starting to rhyme. (laughs) What if Paul, when he says the word all, what if he's referencing, look at verse 20 of chapter 1. You don't have to turn a page or nothing. Everybody look at verse 20 of chapter 1. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Remember we talked about them last week? These were people who were spreading false doctrine in the church. They were causing great damage within the church. What if the all that Paul is talking about is Hymenaeus and Alexander? In fact, it has to be. It has to be. These men who were disrupting the church, teaching falsities, Paul is telling the Ephesian believers, you should be praying for them. The people that hurt you the most. See, we are called to pray for all to be saved. Let's get a little bit more specific with this, shall we? Because it's not really applicable if we don't have real specific people, right? Paul says specifically in verse number 2, For kings and all who are in authority. You see, he's getting specific. First he says, everybody. And now he's saying, Kings and those in authority. You see, we are called, or we are not called to be indifferent to those in authority over us, but to pray specifically for their salvation. We are commanded, Paul is commanding the believers at Ephesus, and by way of them, you and me, he is commanding us to pray specifically for those in authority and specifically for their salvation. I need to, I need to make sure that you heard that. He is commanding the believer to pray specifically for the lost, right? For all people who are lost to be saved and specifically for those in authority. But also he is saying to pray specifically, not, listen, not that they would just rule well. He's saying pray for them to come to know Christ. Paul does not command us to pray. Listen, are you listening to say amen? Are you listening to say amen? amen? Paul does not command us to pray for the removal from office of evil rulers. Some of you are wasting your breath in prayers on political rulers that you don't like because you're praying for them in the wrong way. He does not command us to pray for the removal from office of evil rulers or those with whom we disagree politically. Believers are to be loyal and submissive to their government. (gasps) That's anarchy in America, right? Paul is calling the Ephesian believers to pray for their kings and for their authorities. And by way, he is telling you as a believer in Jesus Christ that you too are to be submissive to those in authority. Listen, if the word of God says to do something and your government says to do something contrary to the word of God, you do what the word of God says. Amen? But in all other things, God has placed them in authority. For whatever reason, maybe it's our chastisement, and we are to submit to that authority. We are to be a peaceable people. Believers are to be loyal and submissive to their government. If the church today took the time and energy it spends on political maneuvering and lobbying and poured them into intercessory prayer, we might see a profound impact on our nation. But you grew up a certain way. You were taught a certain way. And your hate has taken over. And so all you can do is lambast the leaders. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. And you haven't prayed a single prayer for the salvation of their souls. How dare you? That is not becoming of a believer in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.4. We've forgotten this. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. You're not going to politicalize this country to the point of salvation. You're not going to call enough names of the enemy to change someone's mind. That's not what you've been called to do, believer. They are not of the flesh, but listen, but they are, listen, 
Here's where the power is divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. You want to see this nation changed? Start praying like you mean it. Every moment you spend on Facebook posting those stupid posts that just tear someone down, maybe spend that time in prayer. The key to changing a nation is the salvation of sinners. The Word of God tells us that it's not by man's anger that produces the righteousness of God. You being angry isn't going to get squat done. It's the weapons of the Lord. It's the, the, the divine power that is found when we are peaceable in times of strife. When we don't strike back. When we don't speak out. When injustice happens to us. I'm not saying don't defend the things that are right. I'm not even saying don't vote. I'm not even saying don't get political. I'm saying don't make that your God. Let God be God and take the power that he has given you in prayer and pray for those. Listen, I can name two people. I think about the, the head of the Republicans, the, the person that most is the most hated person uh, on the right, and that is Donald Trump, no doubt, right? The other side hates him. What if the believers that do not like Donald Trump started to pray for the salvation of this president? When I think about the far left, I think about, I can't even say her name, AOC. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Cortez, thank you. What if instead of slandering her, what if you prayed for her salvation? You see, this is what happened to Paul. Paul was a blasphemer and a persecutor. And what happened? People prayed for Paul, probably. He came to know Christ. And he is the single greatest testimony of the power of God in a man's life that has ever existed. But you think you can change things with some words on Facebook. Golf clap for you. What do you think the Lord's going to say to that junk? Listen, don't misunderstand me. When injustice is happening to the poor, when people are being mistreated, those types of things we should speak up and speak loudly and speak boldly without fear. But when it's just a matter of opinion, listen, we need to cling to the gospel, to the cross, to Jesus Christ, because in it lies true power. Amen. The key, I want you to write this down in your notes, because you're probably agreeing with me in your mind, but you're going to forget it, because something's going to rile you on the right or the left, and you're going to go off, right? And so here's what you need to remember. The key to changing a nation is the salvation of sinners. And that calls for faithful prayer. If this nation is ever going to turn back to God, it's going to be through faithful prayer of the believers. You say, Dave, that's easy for Paul to say. Right? It's easy for Paul to call them, tell the Ephesians, pray for your king. You know, you don't understand Congress. You don't understand leadership. You don't understand how much I hate so-and-so. Well, maybe you have a heart problem, but you're hating anybody, you're not walking in the Spirit. But let me ask you this. Who was the authority in Paul's day? Nero. It was Nero. Nero. How many of you know who Nero was and what he did? Anybody? This was one of the sickest, most vilest men who have ever has existed as a, as a leader. Okay? He was the one that most persecuted the Christians. In fact, the Christians thought that he was the Antichrist. So think about it in context. Paul is telling the people of Ephesus, the Christians at the church of Ephesus, to pray for Nero. Pray for the person who is persecuting the most. Pray for the man who has sexual relations with his mother. Pray for this man who has married his stepsister. Pray for this man who is killing Christians by the hundreds and thousands, pray for that man who is leading you. For his, listen, not so his rule will be lesser, not so he'll get out of rule. No, he says pray for his salvation. None of our leaders hold a candle to Nero. How we should be praying for our leaders. He's not calling them just to pray that he would govern well or act justly. 
but that he, that Nero, would repent and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, believer, we are called higher. Stop living in the basement. Stop stooping to the level of the world, the level of the enemy. We are called to pray for the salvation of all, all people. Even those we think too wicked and vile. You see, one of the problems is is a pride problem. We think, well, I'm not as bad as them, and God will surely save me, but he won't save that person. You see, the scope of the gospel is universal. We are to pray for all men. Number three, the reason for evangelistic prayer. The reason for evangelistic prayer is found in verses 2 through 6. He says, for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator and also between God and men the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. You see, it's a testimony. It's a testimony. When you pray evangelistically for those who are in authority over you, for all men, all women, it is a testimony. We are to submit to those in authority. We mentioned this earlier, but Titus, Paul wrote the book of Titus, and he says this in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It's a little small, but listen to what he says. He says, remind them, talking about the church, to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one. You should put that above your computer or phone. (laughs) To malign who? No one. To be peaceable. Oh, how we could learn something from that one word. The believer is to be peaceable. We are to be peacemakers. Gentle, showing every consideration for... There's the word again. Paul likes that word. All men, for we also once were foolish ourselves. Here's his reason. Because we were sinners too. We were vile and separated from God too because of our sin. And nobody is outside the scope of salvation. No one. Hillary Clinton's not. Barack Obama's not. Donald Trump's not. Not a single person is outside of God's salvation. If God's going to call them, can you imagine what will happen? We are to submit to those in authority. We are to be peacemakers, not reactionaries. He says in this verse, we are to lead and live a tranquil and quiet life. What does that mean? It means be peace, be peaceable. We're not to stir up things. We're not called to be political revolutionaries. We testify not to any political kingdom, but to a heavenly kingdom. Not to any earthly king, but to our heavenly king. And you might hear a little frustration in my voice. is because you got, I see your post. <laughs> I see how you talk. I see what you talk about the most. And as a pastor, listen, I'm going to be honest. It's discouraging. It's discouraging that the kingdom's not the first priority in your life. It's discouraging that you think, you still think that we can accomplish godly means by our flesh. You're not doing anybody any good. And I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you to begin to put forth and to pray for the kingdom of God over a political kingdom. You're going to be gone in a hundred years. And what legacy will you have left? Will your life point to the kingdom of Christ? Will you have spoken more about King Jesus than the current president? Or the opposing party? God forbid. How embarrassing. See, we have a testimony to guard. He says, in all godliness and dignity. Some of you have lost your dang dignity. You're making a fool of yourself and of Christ for a political stance. One commentator said this, When the church prays unceasingly for the lost, especially their troublesome leaders, people begin to see the church as virtuous, peace-loving, compassionate, and transcendent. Listen, this is not an approval of ungodly things. And there is a lot of ungodly things coming from both parties. Right? We need to look at the issue. Who supports the murdering of children? Don't vote for those people. (laughs) Who who, who pushes an ungodly 
form of marriage? Who pushes a a liberal and and progressive agenda that says we need to get further away from godly things and from truth and all those things? Listen, I'm just speaking as real as I can to you this morning. Do that in action. Vote in that way. Speak in a gentle way about who is the best person according to the word of God. But stop maligning. Stop tearing things up. Stop putting people down. Stop trying to do things that will never have any fruit. When the church prays unceasingly for the loss, especially their troublesome leaders, people begin to see the church as virtuous, peace-loving, compassionate, and transcendent. We are to rise above that. Unbelievers should see us as quiet, loyal, diligent, virtuous people. That should be our testimony before an unbelieving world. It's a testimony, but also it's morally right. It's morally right to pray for those who are lost. Even the people you don't like. Even people you think are evil. Verse 3 This is good and acceptable in the sight of who? In the sight of God our Savior. He says it's good. That word good means it's morally right. It's morally right. If you want to do the morally right thing, pray for your leaders, even those who are evil. Matthew 5, 43 and 44, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And what? And pray for those who persecute you. And pray for those who persecute you. And don't ever stop praying. Also, it's what God desires. We see this in verse 4. It says, who, speaking of God, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires that the vilest offender come to him. Does that make you upset? If it does, you don't understand your own sin. You don't understand your own depravity. Psalm 145, 8 through 9, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to who? To all. It's not reserved for you. You're not some special person that, that, listen, God chose you. God saved you because of his glory and his grace. It has nothing to do with you. And he wants to save all people. God desires the vilest offender to come to him. Why? Because of his very nature. That's who he is. You and I should desire, listen, what God desires. Fourthly, it brings God glory. Verses 5 through 6 says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You see, there is one God. And when people come to faith in Christ, who were some of the vilest people ever, guess who gets the glory? I just mentioned Paul was one of the most vilest sinners who has ever lived. And and all Paul ever talks about is the grace and mercy and glory of Jesus Christ and how he interceded on his behalf and how he was, Paul calls himself a blasphemer. He was a persecutor of the church, right? You see, when the more vile, the more wicked a person is, when they come to Christ and when we pray for that person and pray to that person that we just can't stand and we just hate and we think they're wrong and we think maybe even they're working for the devil himself, when that person is prayed for by the believer and that person comes to God in salvation, God gets the glory. There is one mediator, Jesus Christ, and there is one way, the cross. Acts 4.12 And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You see, when you pray for the lost, and when you pray for evil men and women, and when you pray for those who are vile, vile sinners, and they come to know God through his son Christ Jesus, the greatest glory goes to him. And there is power in that. There is power, such magnificent power in that. More than anything you could do in your own flesh. Number four, the attitudes of evangelistic prayer. Uh, Above attitudes, I want you to just simply write another word. I want you to write the application of evangelistic prayer. Because this is what it comes down to. First, it's ownership. Verse 7, Paul says, For this I was appointed a preacher. For what? To preach Christ and Christ crucified for the glory of God so that all men would come to salvation through Christ. He says, that's what I was appointed to as a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. 
You see, it's not enough just to pray evangelistic prayers. You, you, you have been appointed as a preacher of the gospel. You say, Dave, no, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. Listen, a preacher, to preach means to herald. It just means to, to proclaim, to, to speak forth, to let it come out of your mouth. It's not enough to pray evangelistic prayers. You have been appointed to preach to those who are perishing. Evangelistic prayer must not be hypocritical prayer. If you pray for the salvation of the lost, you must be willing to proclaim salvation to the lost. If you do, and I hope you do, pray for the lost and pray for all men and pray for that specific person that you know does not have a relationship with God through the Son, Christ Jesus. If you do pray... You need to be ready to actually proclaim, to tell somebody about Christ and his gospel. You need to take ownership. You need to say this. Are you ready? Say amen. Amen. You need to say, I own it. I'm going to own it. It's, It's mine. I must own it. It's my responsibility as a believer to pray for the lost. But not only that, it's obedience. Verse 8, he says, Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Now I found this very, very interesting because we are a complementarian church. We believe that God has structured the church and the family in a sense, in a way that brings order. And that is that the man is the head of the household and that the men should be the leaders of the church. This is not a, a degradation to women. It's not putting them down. It's the same in value, but different in position. Okay? It's the same in value, but different in position. And so what's happening here is Paul... By way of the Holy Spirit, listen to what he says. Therefore, because of everything I just said, I want who? I want the men. I want the men. I want the men of the church. I want the men of the church in every place, in every church, Paul says, in every church that there is. I want the men to do what? To pray. Remember we talked about prayer and worship, how this lifting up of holy hands, it's, it was a form, it was a posture of worship. But what he's saying is, more importantly, the lifting up of holy hands in that time was saying, I'm living a righteous life. I'm living a life that is pointing to the kingdom. I'm living a life that is pointing people to pray for the lost. I'm living a virtuous life, not perfect, but I'm living, I'm walking in the spirit. I'm doing my best to honor God, to serve the kingdom, to live for Jesus Christ. I'm doing everything I can, and I'm going to lift up my hands. And as a man, as a man, I'm going to lead, lead. The reason our country is in such disrespect disrespect and disrepair is because men aren't leading. In the church. And God bless women. Listen, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you ladies. You ladies are carrying a burden that you shouldn't have to care. That you shouldn't have to carry this. You say, well, I'm quiet and reserved. You can still lead. Well, I don't have this gift. I don't care. He calls the men to do it. Listen, if you're honest with your spouse, if you're honest with your wife, if you honestly ask them in private, do you want me to lead you? If they're honest and they're godly women, they'll say yes, yes. Please, lead me. Lead our church. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. It's obedience. Lifting up holy hands, it's obedience. And this is a simple phrase, I must do it. It's not enough to hear a good message. It's not enough to be... Man, that was really good, Pastor Dave, and man, I'm fired up now, and you're going to fade out in a week. Not unless you commit to obedience. I must do it. What are we talking about? You must do what? You must pray. Men and women, you must pray. Pray for the lost. Pray for those who are perishing. Pray for those who are evil. Pray for those who you dislike and disagree with. Pray and watch. Pray for the person that you dislike in your job. Some of you have horrible, horrible work environments and bosses. And it will bring you such peace if you simply pray for them. You must do it. Now, there's an application at the very last, some of you, that drives you crazy to leave a blank. Right? You don't want a blank there. So I'm just going to tease it out as long as I can. (laughs) The application is very, very simple. It's come pray. At the end of service, we're going to sing, we're going to worship, and if you would, especially the men, I'm calling on the men to come to the altars and pray. 
I want you to hear the power in Paul's words because you have to remember something about Paul and his situation in his life. You Bible scholars, do you remember who was standing amongst the crowd when Stephen was stoned? A young man named Saul at the time who would later become Paul. Do you remember what Stephen prayed as Paul watched him being murdered? He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That is a prayer for salvation if I've ever heard it. Stephen, as he's being murdered, prays for Saul, prays for Paul. God, forgive this man of his sin. Don't hold this sin against him. Don't hold this sin against them who are stoning me to death. God, bring mercy to them. God, bring forgiveness to them. God, help save these people. And God answered the prayer. And Paul was changed. And the world was forever changed. And the greatest missionary that has ever existed was born. Because one person said, I'm going to pray for the salvation of the man and the men who are killing me. That is powerful. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, we come to you in humility. Myself, Lord, being so humbled by this as I've studied it, thinking that somehow, some way, I can manufacture the righteousness of God in this country, in my own sphere of influence, in my own, in my own state, in my own county, in my own home, in my own neighborhood, Lord. Lord, we begin to see your power in our church and in our lives when we first understand that it's it's on our knees, Lord. It's in prayer as we call out to you for the salvation of the lost. For those who are evil, those who are wicked and vile. God, that we would remember who we were. That you saved us. And God, I pray for those specifically in this room, the all in this room that has never heard the gospel, the clear gospel. I think they've heard it today. That if they would humble themselves... If they would bow their knee before King Jesus and trust in him and his work, that they can have salvation, that they can have a relationship with God. Right now their sin separates them from the holy and righteous and perfect God. But because of what Christ has done, if they will trust in Jesus Christ, they can be freed, they can be forgiven, they can have salvation this moment, this day. God, I pray they would make that decision. As the Spirit of God calls them to salvation, I pray they would accept. They would make Jesus Christ not just Savior, but Lord of their life. And from this day forward, they would begin to live for Him. They would swallow their pride and lead their families, especially the men. They would lead their families in righteousness and godliness and prayer. I pray for the believers in this room, including myself, that you would do a work in our hearts so powerful, so mighty, that all the world would look on and say, what is going on there? Help us to remember, our anger, our means, our flesh does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Help us to rely on you. Help us to be doers of the word. And help us to pray for all men and women to come to salvation. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.